Hello everyone and welcome back to another collab. Quite a few of you have commented on my channel since I started doing different collabs with different uh, YouTube channels out there. Paul Thorpe, Paul Thorpe, Paul Thorpe. Paul actually gave me a shout out saying that, you know, I was one of the two YouTube channels that he currently watches. What was most interesting to me is a completely different perspective. You know, the UK watch market versus US market, lots of different things, different pricing and so on. I had Ian prepare a uh, quick sizzler for those of you that are not familiar with Paul's channels, but I think most of you are, so Ian, if you don't mind. Welcome back, watch people, and for those of you that don't know me, please allow me to introduce myself. Well, my name's Paul Thorpe, and today I'm gonna to be bringing you a really important video. This, hopefully, is gonna be an interesting one. I mean, just what is going on with Rolex? You go into central London, you throw a stone up in the air, it falls down, and it's gonna hit a Submariner because everyone's wearing one. But there are lots of other watch brands out there apart from Rolex. My personal philosophy in life has always been to treat other people in exactly the same fashion that I want to be treated myself. Your money is just as good as anyone else's. I was watching a video by um, Roman Schaff. Every word that I've watched come from Roman and I get totally, it's almost like a brotherhood from one side of the world to the other. Thanks for watching and we'll speak again soon. Thanks for that Ian. Uh, now, if you watch Paul's videos, You'll notice a lot of his videos he does out of his car, which I believe to be a Tesla. Uh, I don't have a Tesla. In fact, I have quite the opposite. I have a big gas guzzler sitting outside, a Lincoln Navigator. So in keeping up with Paul's tradition, I'm gonna do this out of my car. Now, if you guys watched the office tour video, Ian taught me this really, really cool trick where I can disappear by hitting the space bar. So, space bar. Uh, Ian, this is not my car. This is Adrian's car. Anyway, it's a gas guzzler. Anyway, it's an Audi S6. Let's get into this. So the first topic I want to start with is uh, Paul's stolen watch. Those of you that follow Paul have seen the video where he's literally trying to catch the guys that stole his Montoya some five years ago. I'm gonna pop the same information on my screen as in Paul's video in case you guys have not seen that video. And I know a few dealers watch this channel, so uh, Paul doesn't want the watch back. Paul just wants to catch the guys that did it. Certainly, look in your databases, look in your inventory system. If you ever have come across this watch, do let Paul know. And again, I'll, his channel will be linked below in case you guys don't follow Paul. I want to talk to you about stolen watches, Paul. And one of the ideas that Paul had, and he discussed it in uh, his videos, was sort of a stolen watch database. There is some cockamamie stuff out there online that you can go and see if something was stolen. You can call the company and ask them if the watch was stolen. Uh, one of the points that Paul made is the brands are really not on board in creating that database. I love the idea of creating that database, and maybe we can talk offline in regards to doing just that been in the business 17 years i've come across plenty of stolen pieces out there that were deemed stolen two three years later and i ended up refunding the money back to the dealer and got my money back from whoever i bought it from and i actually made a video about it where i said really the only recourse you have is to buy from a reputable source then you always have a recourse you can always go back to that dealer keep the watch back get a full refund etc the biggest issue I see with creating a database such as this is how do you trust the source of information that comes in? Any Joe Schmo tomorrow can call and say, oh, this watch was stolen for me and so on and so forth. I think the best way to deal with it is ensure that there's a process in place that can actually verify the information that's given to you. If me and Paul tomorrow open up this uh, stolenwatchdatabase.com, right, or that UK, there has to be required information. And in my mind, the required information has to be the two following pieces. Number one is original proof of purchase. A, I have bought this watch from such and such. Here's the invoice stating all the serial numbers and everything else. And I mean a proper invoice, which in our industry is uh, pretty terrible. So that's number one. Number two is a official police report. There has to be a police report behind it. Oftentimes, people claim watches on their insurance. If this was a case where a watch was claimed through insurance, that a copy of that claim should be submitted just the same. And last but not least, and then any individual out there can contact the company, report a watch stolen, and get some sort of a piece of paper saying that, hey, I reported this watch to the company. If you don't have the opportunity to do it to the company, perhaps report it back to the dealer you bought it from, let's see if it, in case it was an authorized dealer per se. And any other records you may have with the watch, that could be service records, that could be anything and everything that, that is a valid piece of paper tying you to the purchase of that watch, the fact that the watch was stolen. And that's really the only way to start putting that database together. So Paul wanted to get your thoughts on that. Again, my whole thing is this has to be 100% bulletproof because in order for that global database to be trustworthy, the sources have to be 100% trustworthy and verified as far as I'm concerned. Well, the magical, mythical watch dealer from the US, Roman Schaff, 
has sent me a magic keyboard. Let's see if it works. Ooh. Well, first of all, thanks for that, Roman. Thanks for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. And um, I certainly appreciate the shout out for my stolen Montoya. I hope all of my friends out there in the US will keep a close eye on that one for me. Now, on the subject of stolen watches, which, of course, is an international problem, not just here in the UK, but you guys in the US know all about that one just as much as we do. But we're actually very lucky, Roman, and um, we don't need to be setting anything up because we already have um, a brilliant system in this country. It's called thewatchregister.com. Um, they have been going for years and years. They actually are quite active in the United States as well, maybe not quite so well known over in the US as they are here in the UK and indeed further across Europe. But that would be um, where my I would concentrate. I would concentrate on the watchregister.com um, and I would encourage all dealers out there in the US to use their services because they're working closer and closer with the major manufacturers around the world. And I really feel that they're making inroads into the stolen watch issue. Now, whilst the watch register is mainly active in the UK and in Europe, they are already working with people such as Sotheby's, Christie's, Bonhams, etc. out there in the US. So I would strongly advise you guys out there in the States to get on board with the watch register and let's fight watch crime together. Because, you know, the fight against watch crime, the battle against watch crime has to be an international effort. Um, it's the only way that it can be solved. Now, of course, any effort to put a halt or to slow down, at least, the theft of watches has to be an international and coordinated effort. And, of course, Roman is totally correct when he points out that uh, the database must be reliable. Um, and the watchregister.com, they already have a system in place that involves um, all sorts of identification processes, uh, proof of purchase, proof of loss, including pre police reports and crime numbers, etc., etc. Um, and for the first time in a long time, I really feel that uh, the bad guys uh, are now battling against us rather than us battling against them. And here's the thing, Roman, as you already know, the watch community is actually a worldwide community and it's people like yourself uh, and I that are hopefully bringing this community together, making us safer uh, and making the watch world or the world of watches a better place to be in. Whether you're a dealer or whether you're just a, an enthusiast or a, a passing collector, someone with a, a passing interest in watches, um, we're trying to do the right thing by not only our trade, but also our people. Paul, great to get your thoughts on that. Next thing I'm going to talk about is your show. I want to sh I want to talk about the show that you put on uh, in Brighton. Lots of videos by you out there in regards to that particular show. If you guys uh, missed them, check them out. Uh, you guys know, and Paul, you know as well, that I do a lot of wholesale, and now my wholesale takes me to trade shows uh, all over. Let's say I wanted to attend the next show that you throw. Number one concern I would have is security because I would be transporting $20 million worth of goods and my insurance company would want to know how secure the place that I'm going to is. Where would the goods be locked up overnight? Let's say if it's a two-day event. Now on to the Brighton Watch Show. And I'm so pleased that you mentioned that because we do have big plans for 2020. First of all, let's get down to the nitty gritty and that is security because you know, some of my listeners might get bored with hearing me talk about uh, security in the watch business, but you being a fellow watch dealer, you'll know exactly where I'm coming from and you know exactly the right questions to ask. And of course, security at the Brighton Watch Show in 2020 will be absolutely huge. It will be watertight. Um, you ask the question, where would the watches be kept overnight if it was a two-day event? Um, I am currently uh, planning a two-day event. It would be an international watch show. Uh, and I'm very lucky and very pleased to be able to say that just around the corner from the venue that I'm currently targeting, we have a large Metro Bank there. I think Metro Bank are also in the US. Um, they have a vast array of safety deposit boxes. And my current plan um, will be to negotiate with the bank so that everyone's stock could be kept in individual safety deposit boxes locked away overnight in correct safes in a banking system so that i think would be about as safe as we could possibly store those watches as far as security is concerned on the day um well being a fellow watch dealer you know what's necessary i know what's necessary and what's required um, and i think it goes without saying that we would have the place on complete and utter lockdown 
uh, probably the main sh trade show that we do here stateside is IWJG. Uh, and uh, the only place I really get to go outside of the United States is Hong Kong. And the reason for that is Hong Kong is a duty-free zone, so there are no uh, tax implications or VAT implications. You guys have it over in Europe and the UK. Majority of our trade shows are dealer to dealer. And the vibe that I got, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the show that you had was geared towards the retail public. But my question to you was, uh, was the show indeed just retail only show or was there more dealer to dealer business done because oftentimes whenever there's a new trade show that pops up a lot of the business is done among the dealers and majority uh, the people that show up are indeed dealers i wanted to get your take on that to see percentage wise how much of the business in the room was done uh, wholesale i.e dealer to dealer or actually to the retail client now it's interesting to hear you ask the typical dealers question it's the same question that i would ask um, who was spending the money? Who's going to be there? What type of people are there? Well, you know what, Roman, what I was trying to do, and I think we succeeded as I was trying to bring the public into our world, the world of what is that usually people only like you and I see from behind the scenes uh, and the general watch buying public aren't quite perhaps privy or privileged enough to see what we see on a daily basis. Now, certainly the vast majority of visitors to my show in Brighton, and there was a total of about 800 on the day. I would say that uh, probably 75 to 80 percent of the what is sold um, over the course of the day were sold to private individuals. Um, but come on, Roman, you know us dealers. As soon as we get in a watch show, we're all walking around like a load of headless chickens looking for something that, uh, you know, we might want to buy. And of course, all the dealers did a little bit of business between themselves as well. You know what we're like, we can't resist it. Another thing I wanted to ask you and see the feasibility of that, and that's probably something you should look into, how do you attract dealers from outside the country? Because I noticed it was a fairly small show. I actually just did a video that's an edit now when I visited the IWJG show where I talked about shows dying. The B2B trade shows that I attend are slowly but surely dying. And uh, quickly to go through the reasoning was, number one, everybody has a wholesale website. Everything is online. Technology is killing the good old shows. And last but not least, WhatsApp groups. Uh, I myself have a Luxury Bazaar WhatsApp group. Uh, and there are 250 dealers in that group where I post stuff on a daily basis or my staff post stuff on a daily basis. And it's kind of like a virtual trade show. Trade shows get expensive. Trade shows can cost me anywhere from fifteen dollars to $25,000 all the way up to $100,000 when I'm traveling to HK, mostly due to the cost of travel, cost of transport of goods. So here's my question to you. How do you grow your show and open up your show to dealers from the outside? But you know, the Brighton Watch Show was kind of like the beta watch show, wasn't it? It was the Brighton Watch Show version one. It was pretty much done um, on about six or eight weeks notice. Everything was done in a rush. And I think everyone that was there on the day will testify that I think we just about got it right. Um, I deliberately kept it quite small. I wanted to dip my toe in the water. I didn't want to jump straight into the pool, as it were. Um, but I actually ended up about knee deep in any case. But as far as your question about would I be able to attract dealers from overseas, the answer to that is absolutely yes. Obviously, Roman, we're in Europe. Um, you know, all the countries that uh, are major as far as watch dealing is concerned. You know, you talk about Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Greece. You know, they're all only an hour or two's flight away. Uh, so those dealers, I have lots of friends right across Europe be no problem whatsoever to me to be bringing dealers in from across Europe and indeed I'm hoping from the United States and I can tell you now that my visitors and my viewers to my channel will be absolutely delighted to welcome the wonderful Roman to Brighton next year and um, you'd be the star of the show my friend so there's no question if you're coming you've got to come my number two concern is taxes I'm gonna have to have an ability to import them in and only pay the VAT to the government on the goods that were sold, which I would in turn would charge the clients that would, let's say, buy watches or jewelry. That's my second concern. And of course, the third concern, the amount of marketing you do for the show and the amount of people that will show up would actually make it worth my while to pick up, bring staff with me and make an expensive trip for say, would I actually be successful there in selling. Based on what you saw in the show, what was actually selling, was it more modern, more vintage, what brands were selling better? And this is just to compare you know, the markets uh, at trade shows here in the United States and Hong Kong versus the show that you did. 
Now next year, I would hope to raise those attending figures to somewhere between two and 4,000 visitors over a two day period. So that would give you some indication of the size of the show that I'm looking at next year. Um, I know you talked about tax implications. That is a problem for visitors outside of the European Union. Of course, um, as far as I'm aware, what you'd need to do is you'd need to declare everything as you come in, just a basic, simple list to customs and excise here in the UK. Tell them exactly what you've bought in and the value of each piece. And then when you leave, you simply tell them what you've sold, um, how much you've sold it for, and you pay the VAT on the difference. But look, but who knows? This is a year away almost, and by then, if our governments get together and get their act together, we may even have some kind of free trade deal in place, which means that you can just come and sell as you wish. You can buy as you wish, and then vice versa. I'll be able to come over to the United States and buy and sell. That will be absolutely wonderful. You know what? I may even resurrect my watch career if that was possible. So perhaps uh, I may see you at one of your next events if uh, we can get it all together and you think it might be worth my while, perhaps we'll make that trip and see how the UK market does. Uh, last thing I want to talk to you about is the video that you put out on watch choices where you mentioned a few pieces. Uh, this isn't something I can do from the car, so I'm going to have to space bar out of here back to my office. Except this car does not have a space bar. How about the start and stop button? <laughs> Whoa. Okay, I guess the start button worked as well. Anyway, let's talk about you asking your viewers for advice in regards to a watch you want to buy for yourself. I am one of your viewers. I, of course, I'm going to be a bit biased because I'm also a watch dealer. Not that I'm trying to sell you a watch, but... So what were the choices you put on the screen? Well, first of all, we're kind of all over the board in terms of price. You started with a Sea Dweller, the James Cameron, as we call it. What do you know? I just happened to have one here, right? So the James Cameron has always signified one thing, and that is an option for a big Rolex in stainless steel. Rolexes in today's standards in comparison to APs, let's say, are fairly small. Even uh, the big dates, just the 41 millimeters. You know, today we're going 43, 44, 45 millimeters. And I feel that the James Cameron gives you the opportunity in regards to size. So if this is the only thing you put up on your screen, I would tell you, bravo, this is an excellent choice because this is a big Rolex. It's a thick Rolex, right? So to me, a James Cameron is always a good choice if you're someone out not looking to break the bank, but at the same time want a large watch and you want a Rolex. And again, what are the options for large Rolexes today? You have your Deep Sea, you have the Yacht Master 2, white, yellow, go right the two-tone and steel and uh, you also have the new uh, yacht master on the rubber strap which i think they did in the 43 millimeter now which is a bit bigger but not as thick as this guy but wait there's more of course you have uh, some options when it comes to the sea dwellers if you really don't want to break the bank and sort of get an everyday beater as we like to call it i wouldn't even go with the james cameron dial i would go with the black dial the James Cameron graduating blue dial is a great looking dial, right? And let me put the two side by side here. But if you get a nice close up, you can sort of see this radiant. It's tough to catch with the camera. You sort of see that radiant blue coming through the green writing on the screen. But if I do this, they look exactly the same. And the difference in price is in the minimum of 20% on the secondary market for sure, sometimes even more. The original one with the black dial, you can get out there. Fairly cheap in, com in comparison to the blue dial. There was a big hype when these came out. They were trading high, then they came back down because there's a lot of them made. I think in the future, this thing will go up further than this guy, but I don't think that's what, something you're concerned with. So in the very least, if it's really pleasing to you to look at the blue dial and the green writing in, in comparison to the black dial, for the most part, it's the same exact watch. And from afar, nobody can ever tell the difference, right? Last but not least, uh, the newcomer, which is the thinner sea dweller, right? It's not as thick as the two guys that I just showed you. That has the red writing, the coveted red writing. Everybody and their mother wants to have a red sub, whether it's a single red or a double red. I often showed you guys a single red sub that I wear. It's my first vintage watch ever bought, one I will never probably sell. Right now, these are trading at a premium. They're trading much higher than these two that I showed you. And I'm going to put all three now side by side from afar. Not much of a difference, but definitely a much thinner watch. So if you're looking for a bigger watch, this is not the option for you. If you're looking to save a few dollars or pounds, I should say, uh, certainly should be the last option. If you're somebody that's into gimmicky stuff, and I love gimmicky stuff, 
the red sub or the current version of the red sub is certainly something I would go with. I think the best bang for your dollar overall look and feel and size is going to be the plain Jane Black C Law, the first one that came out. The next watch you talk about, the Audemars Piguet Rose Gold Offshore. It's the brick, but on a strap. And you put up a picture with on a rubber strap, which, which obviously somebody has changed. To me personally, I don't have that watch here. To me personally, I feel like that's a bit of an older news. If you're gonna go that route, I feel like the one you should go with, it's like a brownish grayish dial. In fact, that's a watch I showed on my video. Ian can pop that in. The video was called More Bang For Your Dollar. And by more bang for your dollar, I meant there are alternatives to the Hot Royal Oaks, the 5711s, so all the Nautiluses out there that are trading through the roof right now. And oddly enough, the next thing that you mentioned was a watch that I showed in my video, and that was the QE2. I deem that watch to be the best looking offshore, and you said it numerous times yourself in your video. That is a wonderful looking offshore, and lo and behold, I happen to have one here. And I always tell people, buy what you like first and foremost. And at the end of the day, the only thing that has to be said about this watch is what's not to like about this watch. The one thing you mentioned, and that was absolutely true, is this watch demands a hefty dollar. I don't know what they're trading at in uh, UK. Here we're selling this watch, for example, for 60,000 US, right? But the combination of the carbon and the rose gold, the overall gold and black theme, the way it was done is absolutely amazing. And I think this by far is the best looking offshore on the market today. If you're the guy that wants to buy what they like first and foremost, then certainly this is the watch for you. And then you went on to compare it to the Nautilus, right? And this is where I say to myself, if you had to choose between the two, then certainly go with this. I said it in my video, God knows how many 5711s were made out there. And if I go back to pre-crisis of 08, uh, where 5970s and 5960s were trading through the roof and then they took a 50% dump. And the reason for that is because there were too many made. This is a limited edition. There's only so many made that will not be remade. So if I had to choose between this and the Nautilus, I would certainly go with this. That would be my advice. Last but not least, uh, you talked in that same frame, you showed the ceramic offshore. I love the watch. It's a great choice. I think it's a good looking choice. The only thing I will tell you is to consider maybe a bit of a newer version that they came out with recently. And that is, hold on, let me get this off. AP started coming out with these nifty covers, by the way. It's about time. Uh, and that is the gray version of it. I think it's just a striking looking watch. And if I had to choose between the two, simply based on looks, this is the one I would go with. But not quite yet because these guys out of the gate are now trading over list. I would wait a few months until they've come down and the market will come down on them once there are enough out there. Even though this was a boutique only edition, there will be pieces out there and it will come down in price to the level of that black one I feel like. Today they're still trading at three to four thousand dollars over list. And speaking of markets coming down and just to go back to the Nautilus for a second, I would shy away from all Nautiluses because I'm seeing it today and I said it in my video before that the Nautilus is slowly starting to come down. The hype is slowly starting to come down. The market is getting saturated. The majority of the trades on the Nautilus is a dumb B2B. So if 5711 is the watch you decide to go with, wait a bit. I feel there's still room for at least another 20% decrease in price. So Paul, that's my advice to you and and the response to your video of help me choose my new watch. You know, out of everything you picked, I would go with this. This is just a gorgeous watch. And you know, compare this to a 5711, eh, you know what I mean? By the time this video airs, I'm not sure if you have already chosen a watch or not. If you have, certainly show me what it is. Uh, if you haven't, do let me know uh, which way you are leaning. I'd be curious to know, and I'm sure my audience would love to know the same. You know, it's been an absolute pleasure to do uh, one of my first collaborations with such a great fellow YouTuber, in my opinion. Look, guys, I'm not blowing smoke uh, for Roman, but I have to say that I've been keeping a close eye on what he's been doing over here um, in England, and I've been watching Roman for a long time now. Um, and I always have said this, I admire a man that's prepared to put himself out there, put himself in front of people. Now, let's get one thing clear. Roman is a successful businessman. He's a successful watch dealer. The last thing in the world he needs is to uh, put himself out there in front of the world and open himself up to criticism. This is a brave man, um, and it proves to me, um, without a question, that his intentions are completely and utterly honourable, and I admire him for that. Um, and I have to say that there's not many people that are prepared to do this sort of thing. And uh, you watch collectors out there, you watch enthusiasts. 
honestly, I think if you haven't already subscribed to Roma's channel, then at the very least you owe him is a simple click. And by the way, you can also come over to my channel and do the same thing for me. That would be really much appreciated. Now, I've got to say, I'm quite intrigued about this uh, button thing that Roman had in his car. Um, and I'm going to go back to the office now and talk about the advice he gave me about the watch that I should potentially be buying. But I haven't got any buttons in my car. The only thing that I have is this James Cameron Rolex Deep Sea Sea Dweller. Let's see if I press the crown, if it has any effect. Whoa, wow, that's some uh, beautiful watches you got there, Roman, and some wonderful suggestions. And uh, I've kind of taken some of your advice on board. I tell you something, it's a good job that there's a couple of 3,000 miles in between us because that QE2 that you're showing me there, honestly, if you was around the corner, watch disease would get me. I guarantee I would have that watch on my wrist this afternoon. So I'm actually kind of quite pleased that you're a long way away. But thanks for the advice. Uh, I couldn't agree more with some of the tips that you were showing. As you know, I'm already in love and already wearing my James Cameron Rolex Deep Sea Sea Dweller. But the choice I made, in case any of you guys have missed it, the choice I made was actually the AP Diver in stainless steel. And the reason uh, that I chose that watch is that I thought it complemented um, the James Cameron really well. It's also not so much of a security risk. That's a major problem for me here in the UK, obviously having already had uh, one super expensive AP stolen from me, um, kind of feeling a little bit uncomfortable about walking around wearing another one, particularly um, when you're recognizable from a watch YouTube channel. It's a bit of a recipe for disaster. So as I always say to everyone, nine times out of 10, if you see me on the street, I'm gonna be watchless. Um, but there you go, guys. There's the two watches that uh, I wear usually on a day-to-day -day basis if I'm uh, in a, an area that I consider to be safe at least. Um, but thanks very much for your advice. Thanks for your tips. Thanks for showing us some beautiful watches. Keep that QE2 for me, Roman. Put it aside and I'll see you next year at the Brighton Watch Show and I think I'll probably be buying it. And lastly, I just want to say, Roman, let's build this watch community together. Um, let's get those hands across the ocean. Let's work together. Um, let's uh, make the community stronger. Uh, give ourselves more power to, to have more influence because I think um, that's really important for us guys, us independents these days. Um, we must have influence, we must have people's ears um, and we must have people's trust and then we can only do that um, by working together, building this community um, and I'm really looking forward to 2020. I want to thank you for taking me up on my offer to do a collab together. This was a lot of fun. Perhaps the next video we do, we can do it the other way around. We can ask me a few questions and or maybe I'll just see you in London. We can do a video together. As they say in the UK, cheers, my friend. It was a pleasure. See you guys soon.